eternal and everlasting God, we thank you, Lord, for this yet another formal opportunity to preach and to teach your gospel. I ask now, Lord, that you stand up in me, and that your word may be taught, that your word may be learned, and that your word may be applied. Speak now, Lord, for your servants are listening. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Normally I teach and preach from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Uh, but I'm using New King James uh, this morning. So if you're using your Bible app, if you want to go to New King James, you can do that. But whatever you have, just read with us. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Are you there? Let's read together. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Verse 12 again, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I want to use for a subject this for that. This for that. In this model prayer, after Jesus teaches about trusting in the Lord for our daily provisions, because we know that God is our provider, that he knows what we stand in need of before we ask him, and that this same God is able to give us daily bread, just like he fed the children of Israel with manna from on high. And after Jesus says that we can trust the Lord with all of that, he moves into the next movement of this model prayer. And it's there that we see a word that shows up for the first time in this prayer. And that word is and. Now don't fail to notice this because the prayer of forgiveness begins with and. So now I need to remind you that and is a conjunction, which means that there's some connection and some association from what is about to be said and what was already said. So this part of the prayer to suggest to us that there's a connection and association between verse 11 and verse 12. So the prayer for daily bread is somehow connected to the prayer of forgiveness. And what that tells me is that we need pardon as much as we need provision, that we need forgiveness as much as we need food, and that we need compassion as much as we need nourishment. Because every day all of us need the Lord to feed us with daily bread. And every day all of us need the Lord to forgive us. Because as much as we need the Lord to answer our prayers and to make a way out of no way, every day that we pray all of us need the Lord to look beyond our faults and to forgive us of our failures and to excuse our shortcomings and to pardon our sins. And I know that you didn't come to church to be called out of your name this morning. But let me remind you that you are a sinner. And Jesus knows that every single day of our life that we fall short of the will of God. And I know that that's going to mess some of y'all up because your Bible is big. And you have about six scriptures memorized. And your name is on the list of about two good ministries in the church. And you lead some songs. And you teach Sunday school. And you about to be a deacon. You serve as a trustee. But every day, everybody in this place falls short of the will of God. And I can already tell y'all ain't going to like this. So go on and tell your neighbor he's talking about you right now. And no matter, no matter how much we try to minimize it and say that it wasn't a big deal, no matter how much we try to rationalize it and give an excuse of why we did it, no matter how much we try to compare it and say that it's not as bad as what somebody else has done, if the truth be told, all of us sin and all of us trespass. Because the sin means that we miss the mark. So no matter how holy we try to be, even at our Sunday best, 
we miss the mark of God's call on our life. That's why God tells Israel through the prophet Isaiah that all of your righteousness are like filthy rags and your iniquities like the wind because we sin and we trespass. And y'all know what trespass is because we go places that we shouldn't go. And we find ourselves as a place that should be off limits to a born again child of God. And we do things that we shouldn't do with people that we shouldn't do them with. And just like sheep, we've all gone astray and turned everyone our own way. And have gone places that have done things that are displeasing to God. And y'all, because we sin and because we trespass, we become devils to God. And we owe God because whatever we sin, we run up our bill with the Lord. In the same way that somebody who borrows money is obligated to the lender, Jesus teaches us that when we pray, forgive us of our debts, that we should understand that our sins has an obligation to the Lord. Now, somebody is already saying, well, hold on, preacher, because how do I owe God if Jesus already died for my sins? And y'all, it's real simple, because Paul tells us in Romans 6 and 23 that the wages of sin is death. So here's why we owe God, and it's real basic. Because we sinned, but we didn't die. And y'all, if you really caught that, the least you could do was wave amen. Because you sinned, but you still here this morning. You sinned, but your car still started. You sinned, but you still got food in your refrigerator. And because the Lord didn't kill you, and because God didn't take you out, we owe God for the breath that we breathe. We owe God for the daily bread that he gives. We owe God for the blessings that he's granted us. We owe God our lives. And is there anybody in here this morning who knows that you are alive today because the Lord looked beyond your sins and blessed you with life anyway? Tell somebody I'm in debt because we owe God. So now I need to tell y'all that there's some good news and some bad news about being in debt. So let me give you the bad news first because the bad news is that we owe God. But God already knows that we can't repay him because there's nothing that you own, nothing that you have, nothing in your safe deposit box, nothing in your nightstand, nothing under your mattress, because there's nothing that we can give God that will ever be enough payment for the debt that we owe. And no matter, no matter how much you think you can do, no matter how holy you try to be, no matter how many scriptures you know, no matter how many Sundays you come to church, there's nothing that we can do to pay the price that we owe God. Now, y'all, for as much as I enjoyed the culture and the comfort of being in Atlanta, I realized early on that I could never live there. Because one of the mistakes that I made when I got there is that I decided I wasn't going to shop low level no more. And I wasn't going to be shopping at TJ Maxx and Marshalls all the time. So when I first got there, I decided I was going to Lenox Mall. And I had a reality check when I went from Cross Creek Mall to Lenox Mall. So I'm with some of my classmates my first semester there. And I really don't know any of them like that. So my pride and my ego was telling me I needed to buy something because we're already in there. And I didn't want them to know that I was a broke preacher from North Carolina. So we in this one store and I grabbed a black tie because I'm thinking that a black tie can't cost that much. So I get to the counter, and now I got to buy the tie because my classmates are around me, and I don't want to be embarrassed. So the lady rings up the tie, and I pull out my Capital One card because I knew that I still had a little credit on it. So I pull out my Capital One card, and the lady says, sir, we don't take Capital One. So I said, okay, that's all right. So I pulled out this prepaid Visa gift card that somebody gave me. So I gave her that prepaid card. And she said, sir, we don't take prepaid cards. So then I pulled out my food line MVP card. Because at that point, I don't know what to do. And she said, sir, we only take cash. And we only take American Express. And I said, well, I don't have enough cash to pay for it. And I sure enough ain't got no American Express. And she says, well, you don't have what it takes to pay for what you've chosen. And y'all, with every sin that we commit in our lives, no matter how much we try to pull out to pay for it, the Lord looks at it and says that I can't take that payment for your sins. 
So you coming to church on Sunday doesn't pay for your sins. You coming to Bible study doesn't pay for your sins. You being nice to people doesn't pay for your sins because we don't have what it takes to pay for our sins. Tell somebody that's bad news. But let me give you some good news because the good news is that God forgives sins. Let me say that again because based on your clapback, maybe you didn't hear me good because God forgives sins. Only about five of y'all sinners got it. So let me see if somebody else is going to catch it. Because God forgives sins. Y'all, I'm going to keep saying it until you celebrate it. Because God forgives sins. And somebody ought to be glad this morning that even if you can't pay it, that Jesus paid it all. Because that word forgive means to cancel a debt. Which means that Jesus looked at the bill that you owe his daddy. And he canceled that bill. Because that's what he did on the, cro the cross of Calvary. And y'all, as a good Baptist, whenever you hear the preacher take a turn and start marching Jesus up Golgotha's hill and being stretched wide and nailed to the cross, you ought to get real happy. Because the Bible tells us that on that cross that Jesus made the declaration that it is finished. And that means that our debt has been paid. So y'all, when Jesus died, he paid off your bill. When Jesus died, he paid the price for your sins. When Jesus died, he washed away your sins. And that's why we sing at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. That's why we sing Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe. Because my sin had left the crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. That's why we sing the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power because Jesus paid the price for our sins. But y'all, I got some more bad news because Jesus paid it all because he knew that we couldn't repay it. But y'all, there's a disclaimer that we find in that second stanza of verse 12. And it says, as we. So y'all, what Jesus teaches us is that God will forgive our sins in the same way that I forgive others. Now, I already know that y'all ain't gonna like that because I didn't like it either. Because that doesn't sound too good to me. Because I really just want the Lord to forgive me. And you just want God to forgive you. But what Jesus teaches us here and what he maintains throughout the Bible is that God's forgiveness of our sins it's connected to and united with and dependent upon us forgiving others. And y'all, that hurt my feelings. Because what Jesus teaches us in this prayer is that if I don't forgive you, then God won't forgive me. And that means that some of us are in trouble this morning and on our way to hell. Because somebody on your road today, and maybe in your seat, came to church mad at somebody, holding on to something that was said and you feel sanctified and justified to be sitting in a progressive and a passionate church with your Sunday best on, with your Bible in your lap, singing about how great thou art, shouting at shouting time, and you're going to leave this place still determined not to let it go. And somebody is saying, but you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what they said about me. You don't know how many times this has happened, and I've had enough. And y'all, I want to suggest to us this morning that the devil understands as we more than we do. Because the devil understands that if he can hurt you badly enough and offend you seriously enough, that he can put you in a place where you don't forgive and mess up your relationship with God. Because when we don't forgive others, God won't forgive us. Now, I already know that the further that we go in this sermon, the quieter it's going to get. But I want to give you a heads up that every day that somebody is on a demonic assignment to offend you and hurt you, every day somebody gets up and their only assignment is to get on your nerves. Every day this, the devil gives somebody the exercise and the training to make sure that they offend and hurt you with the hope that you will be so unforgiving that you block the Lord's power to forgive you. So let me tell y'all how serious this is. Because if we go back to Matthew 5, around verse 23, 
Jesus says, this is how I want you to conduct yourselves in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and you're about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge against your brother and your sister. Abandon your offering. Leave immediately and go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then, come back and work things out with God. So y'all, we can't worship God with an unforgiving heart because there's nothing that we can give God with our hands that is, if there's unforgiveness in our hearts. So when you shout with an unforgiving heart, it means nothing to the Lord. When you come to church with an unforgiving heart, it means nothing to God. When you sing in the choir with an unforgiving heart, it means nothing to God. When you sit on the front row with an unforgiving heart, it means nothing to God if there's unforgiveness in your heart. And y'all, if we weren't trying to build this building, I would tell some of y'all to keep your tithes and your offering until you dealt with the unforgiveness in your heart. Because whatever we give the Lord is unacceptable if our hearts ain't right. Because the text teaches us that if we want our debts forgiven, that we have to forgive other people. So we should want the Lord's forgiveness of us to match how we forgive others. So real fast, how does the Lord forgive us? The Lord forgives us completely. Let the church say completely. Because there's nothing that God can't forgive. Because Jesus' death on the cross covers everything. So there's nothing that you can do that God won't forgive. So we have to learn to forgive people completely. That's why when Peter asked Jesus, how many times do I have to do this? How many times do I have to forgive people? And Jesus tells them 70 times, 70 times, which means as often as you do wrong, you should forgive them. And y'all, I know that's hard because somebody has some repeat offenders in your life. And the Lord says, keep on forgiving them. Keep on forgiving them every time. Keep on forgiving them no matter how often. So no matter how many times your brother's brother sins against you, forgive them. No matter how many times your sister does you wrong, forgive them. And forgive them completely. But y'all, not only does the Lord forgive us completely, but the Lord forgive us immediately. Let the church say immediately. Because what if the Lord forgave like us, like we forgive other people? Because y'all know how we do. Because we say, I'm just not there yet. Or we say, I'll forgive them, but it's going to take some time. But what if that was the Lord's response to forgiving us because he's not there yet? Because if the Lord delayed his forgiveness, all of us would be dead. And the text teaches us that we can't justify it by saying that we'll get around to it. But as soon as somebody offends us, make it a goal to forgive them as soon as possible. Because the Lord forgives completely. The Lord forgives immediately. And the Lord forgives generously. Let the church say generously. Because ain't it good to know that the Lord doesn't make us pay for everything that we've done. Because the text teaches us that when we forgive people that we need to let it go. So don't look for payback. Don't look for revenge. Because we won't always admit that we won't pay back. But we'll say let God's will be done. We won't always acknowledge that we won't revenge. But we'll sanctify getting them back by trying to get the Lord to do our dirty work. So we'll say the Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And we'll quote some scripture in a minute. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, because they're going to sow what they reap. Oh, I ain't got to do nothing about it, because the Lord is going to take care of this. And we sit back and we wait for God to take them down. And y'all, if this happens, we may not testify about it, but we'll be real happy about it. What you happy about, girl? Girl, God is good because the text teaches us to forgive them generously and to take no joy in watching nobody else hurt. Because here it is, Deacon Smith, because forgiving somebody is really my responsibility for God forgiving me. Because forgiveness is the product and the outcome of us already being forgiven. Because when you know what the Lord has forgiven you of, it ought to make you so happy that you don't have a problem forgiving nobody else. And y'all, I've been close to the Lord and attached to the church for 45 plus years. And I still can't understand why church folk are so mean and so messy. And I ain't talking about nobody on your row, but I'm talking about somebody on the road behind you. Because you have you ever wondered why we sit in church every Sunday 
and we act so ugly and so nasty. Now, I ain't talking about nobody on your row, but I'm talking about somebody on the row in front of you. Have you ever wondered why church folk get so mad when you ask them to move over? Have you ever wondered why church folk can have an attitude about some orange juice and some coffee? Have you ever wondered why church folk get mad when somebody else leaves the song? But y'all, I think I figured it out why people in church can be so mean. Because I think that we, when we come to church, that we forget all the sins that God has forgiven of in our lives. Because if we really knew what the Lord has erased in your life, and what the Lord didn't let you reap what you sown, and how generous God has been to you, if you really understood that, you would have a smile on your face all day long. Because an unforgiving heart is an ungrateful heart. Because whatever somebody has done to you, it's not enough to measure what you've done to God. And the Lord says if I overlook your stuff, that you ought to be, over to be able to overlook somebody else's stuff. So what Jesus wants us to know is that forgiveness is in your best interest. And somebody needs to hear this because you thought that forgiveness was about the person that did you wrong. And you ain't going to let them off the hook. But who are you really hurting when you don't forgive? Because when we don't forgive, half of the people don't know that you didn't forgive them. And the other half don't care if you do or don't. So you the only one staying up all night long with an ulcer and a headache and high blood pressure because you call yourself getting even. And you, gonna, you don't want to make them pay. Now, y'all, here's what messed me up. Because in verse 13 after the amen, Jesus continues to teach about forgiveness in verses 14 and 15. And he says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Now don't act like y'all didn't see that. Because if you don't forgive, if you can't forgive, if you won't forgive, then neither will God forgive you. And that's why I had us declare the Lord's Prayer together. Because if you leave here today with an unforgiving heart, you basically curse your own life. Because you prayed earlier for the Lord not to forgive you if you can't forgive nobody else. So let that marinate in your spirit for a minute. Because what has anybody ever done to you that is so bad that it's worth being risking your relationship with God? What could they have done that was so bad that in exchange for what they did, that we don't want the Lord to forgive us? Because I don't know about y'all, but my destiny is too important to be put in the hands of somebody else who was already under assignment to offend and hurt me. And when we don't forgive, we allow the person that hurt us to control us. So watch this, and it's about to get real quiet up in here. So let the church say amen. So the Lord says that since it's your best interest to forgive them, that you should forgive them even when they don't apologize. Forgive them if they never say I'm sorry. Forgive them if they never acknowledge what they did was wrong. Forgive them if their apology is not sincere. Because if you ever had somebody apologize to you and it wasn't sincere, and they say, I'm sorry you feel that way. But Jesus teaches us to forgive them anyway because it's in your best interest. Let me try to wrap this thing up and to help somebody know that we have you truly forgiven somebody. Because you can say that I forgive them, but you and the Lord know that you really don't mean it. And I don't want us leaving here thinking that all you have to do is say the words, I forgive you, but don't prove it in your actions. Because forgiveness is not just a response to what we say, but forgiveness is a reaction that we, that we prove. So y'all, here's a step-by-step -step way of knowing if you really forgive somebody. And Jesus gives it to us in Luke 26 and 28. And you don't even have to turn to it, because I'm going to walk us through it. Love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Bless those that curse you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. Now don't miss this. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who spitefully lose you. So here's our step-by-step -step guide to forgiveness. Love. Do good. Bless. And pray. So here's how you know that you've forgiven them when you remind yourself that you still love them with the love of Christ. 
And y'all, I know that that's hard because some people are mighty hard to love. But can I tell you something? Because so are you. Because as big as your smile is, the Lord looks at you every day and says, you show sure are hard to love. Because every time I do good by you, you still do me wrong. And that's the heart of our discipleship. When we refuse to allow an offense or a hurt to make us stop loving. So when Jesus tells us to love our enemies, what he's really saying is don't allow the offense to change who you are in Christ. And to be who you are in Christ, which means that you are called, which means that you are equipped, which means that you are empowered to love. And what makes us children of God is that we can love people who are hard to love. So let's see if we got step one down. Tell somebody I love you. Now just to make sure, I ask them for real. And Jesus says do good by them. So don't just say that you love them, but do good to them. So here's how you know that you've forgiven somebody. Because you would help them if they needed you. Now I might not volunteer to be the first one. And I might not answer the first time you call. But I refuse to let somebody who has offended me struggle if I can still help them. But he, Jesus tells us to do good by them. That's why Proverbs tells us that if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will reap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. So buy them a candy bar. Volunteer to take him to lunch. Be the peacemaker. And Jesus says, and bless them. Now that doesn't mean give them money. But what it means is not to curse them. Because when somebody has done us wrong, the one thing that we don't like is for other people to still like them. So if I do you wrong, and I walk into a crowd where people like me, you think it's your godly responsibility to tell the crowd about me. Girl, if he, he ain't all that, if you only knew what he did, let me tell you about that man. But you know that you've forgiven them when you can keep the offense private. And when I refuse to tell everybody everything about what I know about you. Because I'm not going to curse you, but I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to pray for them. Not pray about them, but pray for them. Because you know that you've forgiven them when you pray for the Lord to bless them. And when you get on your knees and you ask God to have mercy on them. And to ask God to forgive them for what they've done. And to keep his hand on their life. Because we can't hate somebody and pray for them at the same time. So when we forgive somebody, no matter how hard it is, it starts and it ends with prayer. Because when we pray, the Lord helps us forgive. Because when we pray, we should pray like this. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. God bless y'all.